Straight out of Philly, this is the Reluctant Theologian Podcast. I am your host, Dr. R.T. Mullins from the University of Lucerne. Everything that is born is destined to die. Human existence is filled with tragedy. Should we continue having children? Should we bring life into existence knowing full well that it will come to an end? Today, I have Dr. Larry Lonenen on to discuss his personal experience with having a child with a disability, the grief of losing that child, and his reflections on antinatalism. If you'd like to support the show, you can donate money to my Patreon account or my Ko-fi account. Any donation amount helps me out in so many different ways. I greatly appreciate all the support people have already offered. If you have questions or topics you'd like to hear on the show, you can send me a message at rtmullins.com. Ready or not, here's Larry and I talking about disability, grief, and theology. So I'm here with Larry Lonenen. So Larry, you recently defended your PhD at the University of Helsinki, and by the time this airs, like you'll, I've already like walked across the aisle, and you've gotten you'll. Wait, will you get a sword? Uh, no. Uh, well, I I could get that if I wanted to, but I think I had to. I'd had to pay for it. Oh, okay. Because like, so for people listening, like uh, in in Helsinki, like when you get your PhD. In a lot of the disciplines, you get a sword, but I knew, like in theology, you didn't get you get a, a Bible or something, is what Aku had told me. But I didn't know if yours, since you did uh, cognitive science of religion, like are you in the philosophy department or are you in the theology department? Theology. You're in the theo- theology. Okay. I, it, might, it might be that I couldn't get a sword if, even if I wanted to. So uh, actually, I, I don't know about that. Yeah. Okay. So for anybody listening, if you wanna if you wanna get a PhD and get a sword, come to Finland, but don't do theology because you'll get a Bible. Go like uh, get a degree in philosophy. So, so anyway, so in your thesis, like you are analyzing different philosophical and theological implications for the cognitive science of religion, but that's not the topic of today's discussion. Uh, so, so Larry, like, like me, like you have a sibling with Down syndrome, but you also have some other experiences with disability. So, so tell me a bit about Hugo. So Hugo was my and my wife's firstborn son. He was born in April, 2018. And the pregnancy went normally and the doctors were not concerned about anything. But right when Hugo was born, they noted something was wrong. Uh, he was small, only two kilos, and his other foot was twisted a bit. And there was very little amniotic fluid. So they rushed him to the intensive care unit and attached him into all sh- sorts of machines. And many days went by after we got to hold him for the first time. And eventually they found out that many of Hugo's bones or some of his bones had fractured early in the pregnancy, but they had healed later. And uh, the doctor's first guess was that it was this rather well-known condition called osteogenesis imperfecta. Osteogenesis imperfecta, I don't know how you pronounce that. Mm -hmm. But also known as as the brittle bone disease. And children born with this condition have soft bones that break easily. So early on, we had to get used to the idea that Hugo's life would not be normal. He might have to use a wheelchair. He could not run and play and do certain sports and so on. But after a few months, it turned out that that was a false diagnosis or a false guess. Um, so they ran more, ran more tests. And at this point, I actually celebrated the fact that it wasn't this terrible condition. Oh, yeah. Uh, and, and I, I was really thankful for it. But of course, we didn't know what it was. So eventually, uh, it turned out that it was something even more serious. Hugo, Hugo had a rare genetic condition known as mu- mucolipidosis 2 or eye cell disease. And uh, at this point, my English vocabulary is pretty limited. And I uh, did write up a short description or take it from the internet. And I'd like you to read it if you would, about what this condition is all about. Mm-hmm, sure. So so eye cell disease is an inherited metabolic disease that affects the body's ability to carry out the normal turnover of various materials within cells. So early physical signs include abnormal skeletal development, coarse facial features, and restricted joint movement. So children with eye cell disease usually have enlargement of certain organs, and affected children often fail to grow and develop in the first months of life. So delays in development of their motor skills are usually more pronounced than delays in their cognitive skills. And because of their lack of growth, children with eye cell disease develop uh, short trunk dwarfism or underdeveloped trunk. 
And these young patients are often plagued by recurrent uh, respiratory tract infections, such as pneumonia. And then children with eye cell disease generally die before their seventh year of life. So yeah, so this is a really rare condition. And um, but Hugo was a really happy and social boy who could also sing really well and uh, do a lot of stuff, play and uh, have fun. Uh, but he didn't really grow after the age of one. He never learned to crawl or stand or even to sit on his own. And he didn't learn to speak any words. Um, and he did have a lot of medical issues. And uh, for those interested to see what Hugo was like, there's actually a short documentary we filmed last year. Mm-hmm. And it can be found from YouTube. Uh, it's called A Short Life Worth Living. Yeah, and I'll, and I'll put that link in the uh, show notes for everybody listening. You can find that there. So as some people listening uh, know, I mean, they, they are, they're aware that Hugo passed away this last spring. Uh, and I, I was really heartbroken. I was really gutted when I woke up that, that morning and saw that, that news. And so I know this has been like a roller coaster of emotions for you and your wife, Mina. But perhaps like you can tell me just a bit about the passing of Hugo. Yeah, sure. So, ever since August 2018, we knew that this day was coming. And there's an international Facebook group for families with ISL children. And almost every single month, someone's kid is hospitalized, or many kids are hospitalized and and, and die in that group. And all the time, new people come in who find out that their children have been diagnosed with ISL. So we kind of knew what to expect, although we did think that Hugo would live to be older than three. Mm-hmm. Um, so these kids suffer from recurrent res- respiratory, respiratory tract infections. Mm-hmm. And um, winter in Finland can be pretty harsh in terms, terms of infections. And yeah. we stay mostly indoors and viruses and bacteria are having a feast. And and through the Facebook group, we knew two Finnish mothers who had had a child like Hugo, and we knew that both of them had passed in the age of three as a result of recurrent infections. So during the COVID lockdowns, uh, Hugo remained in very good, good health in one and a half years. That was actually a very good and important time for my family because... Uh, my wife was able to do his work from home. I was doing my PhD. We were both home and so on. Um, but soon as people were free to move again, um, Hugo got a pneumonia. And that was followed by other illnesses. And the last three weeks and three days of his life, he was attached to a heavy breathing support. And he had to wear this tight-fitting face mask that covered both his mouth and his nose. It was rather heartbreaking to see a little boy who weighed uh, eight kilograms wearing a big mask like that, a mask that was actually meant for children weighing at least 10 kilos mm. and up. So so he spent his you know last weeks wearing that thing. And uh, his breathing didn't seem to get any better, although there were no longer any infection in his body. There were no signs that he had any virus or bacteria any longer. Um, eventually, they found out that only 25% of his lungs were functional. It, it was almost like a very serious COVID infection. You know, you've mm-hmm. seen those pictures online with yeah. people whose lungs are like destroyed. It, it was like that. So after these scans, the next day, the doctors recommended end of life care. And that took about 24 hours and our families came to say goodbye and, and stay with us. And um, Hugo died peacefully in his mother's arms in the 12th of February. So, so you're doing several things to try to work through the grieving process. And, and one of which is you're, you're writing a book about Hugo and kind of your experiences uh, with, with him. So, I mean, so tell me about the book and just, I guess, the importance of reflecting on grieving. Yeah. So the first thing to say is that I'm terrible at grieving. I, I, I just found that out. I Well, I, I knew beforehand that I am terrible at this, but um, I'm not a very emotional person. I do get angry and frustrated quite often, uh, but certain emotions 
elude me. I cried the day Hugo died, but I didn't really cry before that, and I haven't really cried after that. Mm-hmm. So crying and grieving for me is almost like practicing surfing a bit. Uh, so you know when you're practice when you practice surfing and you try to catch a wave. I've done this a couple of times in U.S. and in Malaysia. Mm-hmm. You sit on your surfboard and wait for a good wave to come. And then when you see that a wave is close by or close enough and, and you start paddling. And after a moment, you notice that the wave is gone. You didn't catch it. And that's how it's, it is with me and, and sadness and grief. I might look at a picture. We have a lot of pictures of Hugo in our apartment and, or a video of him and, and feel this small wave of this small wave rising at a distance. But even if I try paddling, I can't catch it. So this shallow nature of my grief really troubled me even before Hugo died. I, I've been asking myself, what's wrong with me? Are, are some parts of my brain somehow disconnected? Is there something wrong with me emotionally and morally? If I am not devastated by the death of my firstborn son, am I a sociopath? Mm-hmm. On the one hand, uh, we knew this day was coming and we could prepare for it. And, and I've been surprised also how well my wife has handled it. But at the same time, I, I, am, I have been somehow worried about my own uh, uh, reaction. So people say everyone grieves differently. And this is true. Like C.S. Lewis described his grief after losing his wife as something almost like fear or like being intoxicated. This is what he says in, what is the book names? A, a grief observed. Yes, yeah. But whosoever account of grief after losing a child, I read, whether it's Nick Wolterstorff, Billy Abraham, or Aaron Cobb, they are always, always devastated by grief. And people also say that there's no wrong way to grieve. But on the other hand, not everything counts as a grief-related emotion. For example, I felt a sense of relief after Hugo died, because for all the winter we had worried so much what would happen and how could we keep him safe from all the viruses and bacteria and what would happen next year and so on. How long would he be bedridden and have to be attached to this uh, breathing support? Uh, but relief is not sadness. So, uh, and, and I remained, remained pretty functional throughout the whole process And it would have been rather easy for me to continue reading and writing about the philosophy and theology of cognitive science of religion, which is my main thing. But I I didn't want to. I I knew I had to and that I wanted to take time to focus on Hugo's life and death and, and process everything that has happened. And I believe grief and bereavement is not only something that naturally occurs when a loved one dies. I I do believe it's also a moral obligation. Without grieving, we are not properly acknowledging the value of the person we've lost and the relationship that we have lost. So so that is why I decided to work on this book now. And I had the opportunity because I have recently finished my PhD and I'm still on a grant. Mm -hmm. Um, So its working title is A Father of a Dying Son. That's me, obviously. Uh, I'm writing it in Finnish, but if it turns out to be a good book, I might try to get it translated. And there are chapters where I simply describe moments from Hugo's birth and death and his life between. And even when we were expecting Hugo the day I first heard my wife was pregnant, I I have a chapter on that. Mm -hmm. I I tell, uh, so, so my wife told me not to tell any of our friends yet because he wanted to wait. She wanted to wait. Yeah. But I was in a swimming hall that evening in a sauna, like every proper... Like everybody does in Finland. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So, and I wanted to tell someone. Yeah. So I tell every, all the men in the sauna that, that <laughs> my wife just told me this morning that she is pregnant with our firstborn. And it was a, it was a great moment, actually. I love it. I love it. So, so each of the, these chapters, these like kind of more life-centered chapters is followed by a longer chapter where I consider a particular philosophical question related to Hugo's life uh, 
also when while trying to keep all of it understandable for non philosophers because it's it's a popular level book so so there's quite a bit of theological and philosophical reflection there and I should say also that for me this sort of philosophical reflection is an appropriate way to grieve um, in his book grief a philosophical guide philosopher Michael Colby, I don't know how do you say that. I'm name. thinking it's Colby, I don't know. Michael Colby from Edinburgh says that grief is a surprisingly philosophical enterprise. He actually is described, describes grief as a, an emotionally driven activity and a deeply reflective process where we focus on the reasons for why the person we have lost was so important for us. So the more important the person has been to our own practical identity, to the way we like to see ourselves and what we value about our own lives, the more we grieve losing that person. So, for example, I grieved the death of Hugo, not simply because we had a close relationship, not simply because we were intimate. I grieve him because being the father of this particular little person with special needs was such an important part of my practical identity. Mm-hmm. And this relationship was something I valued greatly about my own life. So, uh, Colby also says that the goal and purpose of grief is a kind of self-knowledge. And as our life story has been sort of intertwined with the story of the deceased person, when we grieve, we are sort of updating our own life story and our practical identity in light of what has happened. So, now that Hugo is dead... How am I to see myself and my own life from now on? So grief is a deeply reflective process. And I think for me, reading about these issues and uh, thinking about these things, thinking about Hugo's life and birth and death uh, is a natural way to grieve. No, that makes sense to me because, yeah, because like like you mentioned, I do think that, that grief is the proper tribute to someone because it does demonstrate that this person had value to you. Mm -hmm. And I do think it's the right emotion to have and trying to process that and reflect on it. That seems valuable to me as well. I really, so this strikes me as, is right and intuitive. Um, So, so I'm curious about some of the more philosophical chapters that are going to be in the book because maybe you could tell me a bit about those. Sure. So uh, one chapter is going to be about the rationality of procreation. Mm-hmm. Or, so we all know that making babies, having babies is risky business. So if we're not Catholic and we can kind of choose mm-hmm. <laughs> whether we want to have babies or not, uh, knowing that it's such risky business, there's, there are terrible diseases and disabilities. Uh, how do we still want to have babies so much? And is it just this... Uh, deep desire and uh, instinct that we can't really control and or or does it actually make sense is it rational what is the kind of aspect of hope that we have when we are having children is there are actually a lot of questions in there oh yeah another topic is that we will discuss today is uh, concerns the harms of existence so was Hugo's coming into existence a harm from his own point of view? Should we wish that wish that severely disabled children like him never actually come into existence? Then I have a chapter on the meaning of suffering, uh, kind of theodicy mm-hmm. thing. Uh, do Hugo's sufferings and unt- untimely death have a meaning or a purpose? Is it even morally appropriate to look for a theodicy suggesting that God might have reasons to allow for these sufferings? I have a chapter on prayer. I haven't written much yet, but my question there is why did I pray so little and so rarely for Hugo's recovery? Mm. Maybe this is not a philosophical or theological question as such, but um, I am trying to make sense of my own behavior uh, in in that chapter because I actually do believe uh, that miraculous healings sometimes take place. But there was a lot about... It's just the idea that I can somehow control this situation, Mm -hmm. that I could, by praying enough, I could make him well. And I had people kind of between the lines suggesting that to me. Ah, okay. And I... And I didn't really want to have that control or Mm -hmm. that weight on my shoulders that if I just prayed enough, I could... Maybe, just maybe, I could heal Hugo. And it's, it's quite a 
big burden actually. Uh, yeah, because if it doesn't, well, yeah, because if, if if the prayer like doesn't get answered in the way that you want, then you would start asking yourself, well, was I not praying hard enough? Was I not faithful enough? Exactly. Yeah. And, and honestly, I was really attracted to classical theism mm-hmm. <laughs> at this point because, and or theological determinism mm-hmm. because it was so somehow comforting to think that it, everything's going to go just the way it's going to go. God's going to do what God's going to do, no matter what I pray or how much I try. Right. It's just I have no control over the situation. Uh, I, I, I think there was something about that that was... Uh, that uh, just let it, that helped me to let go. I didn't become a classical theist. Mm-hmm. I'm, I I don't have a strong view on where I stand on those issues. But it was interesting, nevertheless, mm-hmm. uh, to reflect on those issues that I I, I thought about uh, during Hugo's life. I also have a chapter on the moral nature of, of emotions. Uh, so I felt a lot of a lot of anger. Mm-hmm. I wish I would feel more <laughs> sadness and grief. And I and I write about the moral aspect of emotions, and also I finish off with the chapter on the afterlife, where I ask, "Will I meet and get to hold my son in heaven one day?" And that's also something we might mm-hmm. uh, discuss today. I should say I'm not an expert on <laughs> any of these topics, sure. so I basically read a couple of books and jot down some thoughts. Uh, for me, it's also an opportunity to study and think about questions that are mostly new to me, and I. In other some other situations wouldn't allow myself the luxury to delve sure. into because you know you have to focus on you know what you actually know something about and yeah write about that and you got to finish that PhD and like yeah exactly. uh, yeah I understand all that pressure yeah yeah so yeah. so I wanted to allow myself just this uh, time to uh, yeah think about these issues and read and write about them. No, I understand because something I've talked a bit about on the show before is the reason I originally got into the philosophy of emotion was just trying to figure out my own emotions and go, why can't I feel yeah. these things the way that I want? So when you're earlier, when you're talking about the, the surfing metaphor like that, that actually like that really grabs me because I remember when I was in counseling and trying to like just feel and work through my emotions and I could feel like I could be like, oh, there's an emotion coming. Okay. Oh, ooh, this is something sad. All right. Let's cry. We can cry now. Yeah. Ah, okay, I missed it. Nope, not crying now. All right, fine. Okay, maybe I'll cry uh, next year. We'll see. Let's, let's see what happens. So yeah, so like I understand some of these things. That you're just, I think you're describing it really well. I can't help but mention one situation. This was like 20 years ago mm-hmm. or something. I had watched Schindler, Schindler's List oh, yeah, by yeah, myself. Yeah. And in the end, I think they're like, you know, when, when, when the titles or the texts are going, uh, there's this um, scene from contemporary life where these uh, children and offspring of uh, the Holocaust uh, survivors or or victims uh, bring these stones on the tombs of uh, the the victims. Oh, yeah. And uh, that's a very emotional moment and Mm -hmm. and touching. And and I had this... (laughs) Mm -hmm. (laughs) I could, like, push that out of myself. But then I was like... Dang, it's like, is that all I can That's do? It's got. like, it's yeah. just, I, I want to cry more. I would feel so good, but I, I just couldn't. Yeah. So that's sometimes actually quite frustrating. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay, so let's get into uh, some of these sure. different chapters here. So one of the chapters you mentioned deals with, like, whether Hugo's coming into existence was a harm from his own point of view. And so like, this is obviously going to touch on some controversial ideas known as antinatalism. So maybe just just start by defining, like, what is antinatalism? Sure. So antinatalism is the view that it is either always or usually impermissible to procreate. No one should ever under any circumstances have children. (laughs) So despite the fact that this is quite a radical claim that many people find counterintuitive, antinatalism seems to be gaining a lot of support, especially among younger generations. Um, The internet Encyclopedia of Philosophy recently added an entry on antinatalism, and you can also find YouTube channels and a podcast solely devoted to this issue. Okay. And I, I just checked, and the podcast started in January 2020, so it's not very, very old podcast. No, it is quite recent, yeah. So the most well-known defender of antinatalism is David Benatar. His 2006 book is called Better Never to Have Been, The Harm of Coming into Existence, and the arguments he lays out in this volume have been debated in a number of books and special journal issues. 
So to understand Benatar's claim, it's important to differ differentiate between two kinds of antinatalism, misanthropic antinatalism and philanthropic antinatalism. According to misanthropic antinatalism, no more people should be made because of the consequences to other humans, animals and the environment. So many people are rightly worried about overpopulation and climate change and the extinction of several species. And for many young people, these are real reasons not to have any children. But philanthropic antinatalism, however, focuses on the harm done to the individuals who are brought into existence. Since every person's life includes a number of harms, such as pain and the frustration of life goals, coming into existence is always an unfortunate incident. Non-existence is always a better option. So no one is deprived of anything if they never exist. There are no souls in heaven waiting to be incarnated like Origin is sometimes said to have believed. Mm -hmm. So no one is harmed if they are not brought into existence. But existence definitely includes some harms. So it, it, it's really about how bad we think the, these harms are yeah. in total. So it's also important to note that philanthropic antinatalism does not necessarily entail being pro-choice about abortion or supporting euthanasia, even when someone's quality of life is very low. As Benatar argues, the view that lives are not worth beginning does not entail the view that lives are not worth continuing once the milk has spilled and the person has come into existence. So if one believes that a person comes into existence at a moment of conception, like I tend to think, uh, so one could in principle be an antinatalist and still be pro-life, although Benatar himself adopts what he calls a pro-death view, pro -death view. <laughs> okay. morally speaking. He is quite blunt about that. So, so yeah, that's, that's his view. Okay, so, so Benatar argues that for every human being, their existence is a, is a harm. So life is not only bad for those who are born into like some awful circumstances or like they have like really s severe disabilities, but like it's just it's just bad for all of us. Uh, so how does he, how does he argue for that, and and what does this have to do with how you think about who goes life? So Benatar's normative thesis is that procreation is wrong, but this thesis is based on a more foundational claim, and which is that the existence that existence is always a harm. And this foundational claim is the one that I'm interested in. Mm -hmm. So he offers two independent arguments for this view in his book. The first argument, which is quite well known, is the so-called asymmetry argument. But that's not the one I'm interested of, interested in, and I so they won't go into it here because it's quite about rabbit hole. Mm -hmm. So the second argument that existence is always a harm is based on the poor, poor quality of life, of everyone's life. So he argues that the quality of each of our lives is so low that never existing would have been a better option for every single human being. For you, for me, for Elon Musk, for Benatar himself, mm -hmm. everyone. So we might think our lives are good, but we are simply deluded. We are looking at our own existence through rose-tinted goggles. So why am I interested in this argument? The reason is this. So in the, in the chapter in my book, I reflect on the good sides and bad sides of Hugo's life and whether it was a good life overall, a life worth starting and a life worth living for mm -hmm. Hugo. Like the, our little YouTube documentary, it's called A Short Life Worth Living. Yeah. Was it really a life, short life worth living? Um, so we all have intuitions about situations where we think one's quality of life is so low that non-existence would be preferable. For example, imagine a baby who is inflicted with some horrible genetic disease so that he or she is experiencing constant pain throughout his or her short life. So many of us think that it might, it would have been better for that baby never to exist. I say many, not most. Mm -hmm. um, traditionally, philosophers and theologians have thought that existence is always a plus. It's always a good thing to exist than not exist, no matter how much suffering there is in your life. Yeah. But I, few, I, I think very few people nowadays buy into that. 
it's it's very counterintuitive. It, it's a very medieval view, and I don't I don't see it pop up as much outside of the medieval philosophers that I read. Yeah. Yeah, I know. For example, David Bentley Hart in his book "The Doors of the Sea" defends mm-hmm. it and, and and or or makes the makes the point. But yeah, I I I I it's it's very counterintuitive. So, but at the same time, um, in our contemporary Western culture, our thinking seems to be quite the opposite. Actually, we set the bar of a life worth living pretty high. Mm. And we can see this from the fact that pregnancies are terminated for all kinds of less severe conditions, such as Down syndrome. Mm -hmm. Of course, I guess quite often for social reasons and not because of any disease or disability of such. So, but yeah, I remember talking to a young mother who had a girl with Down syndrome. Uh, I think the girl was about two two or three years old. And the doctors had not caught the extra chromosome in prenatal testing. So the lady told me that had they known about the extra chromosome, they would have aborted the baby. And she saw it as such a great misfortune that their child had Down syndrome. Or she told me that when they found out, they thought it was such a great misfortune. And I believe my charitable interpretation of what she told me is that she didn't see it only as a misfortune to herself and her husband, but also to the child herself. Mm. Uh, Of course, at the time of our discussion, she was very happy about her two-year-old girl uh, and, and happy that they didn't abort her. But so initially I had a very judgmental attitude towards this woman like sure. <laughs> or did you think like uh having a healthy child is some human right and doctors have the uh responsibility to make sure that you get your package intact right something like that um but if we t- don't take into account our obviously differing views about abortion i realized my own thinking may not be so far from hers after all So if I would have known that our child would have a severe condition that would lead lead to an early death, and if the choice would have been up to me only, and not my wife also, I might have chosen to remain childless or to adopt instead. So this worries me. This intuition of mine worries me a bit. Do Hmm. I actually see Hugo's life uh, being some kind of harm for himself? So we all have these intuitions about what kinds of lives are worth living. When is coming into existence a harm? When is it not? When is never existing preferable? But uh, I point out in my chapter that these intuitions are not solely the product of pure reason. They are products of our psychological and cultural biases. Mm -hmm. So what I like about Benita's argument is that he challenges the reliability of our intuitions in these questions. Mm. So he argues rather convincingly to my mind that coming into existence is always a harm. So we think our lives are good, but they are not. We are overly optimistic about our own well-being. So I think of Benatar as saying almost something like this. You Western educated rich people think you know which lives are worth living and which lives are not. You think your lives are good lives, but the lives of those with Down syndrome or eye cell disease and other conditions are not. Well, I got news for you. None of your lives are worth living. All (laughs) of your lives suck. So there's something radically interesting and egalitarian almost in this about this claim. It's almost like Paul who says that no matter whether you're a Jew or a Gentile, you're all sinners. Mm -hmm. You're all damned. No one... Uh, is good in the eyes of God. Everyone uh, falls short from the glory of God. So Benatar says, everyone falls short. Every life falls short from <laughs> this uh, for being a good life. So he's he really forces us to question our own intuitions and the way we think about a good life and and what makes life worth living and and starting. So if we say that non-existence is preferable to a life with Down syndrome or with eye cell disease, what it is actually that makes our lives and lives in general worth living? Okay, so the, so there's like three prominent views on how to just like evaluate the quality of life. 
And so these are hedonism, some sort of like desire fulfillment view, and then an objective list view. So just kind of define each of uh, these for us. Sure. So this taxonomy into these three different views comes from philosopher Derek Parfit Mm -hmm. and his book Reasons and Persons. I'm going to quote Benatar here so that I don't misstate these views. Sure. He writes as follows. According to hedonistic theories, a life goes well or badly depending on the extent to which it is characterized by positive or negative mental states, pleasure and pain broadly constructed. According to desire fulfillment theories, the quality of a person's life is assessed in terms of the extent to which his desires are fulfilled. What is, desires, what is desired might include mental states, but it can also include states of the external world. According to objective list theories, the quality of a life is determined by the extent to which it is characterized by certain objective goods and bads. On objective list theories, some things are good for us irrespective of whether they bring pleasure in any given situation and irrespective of whether we desire them. Other things are bad for us, whether or not they bring pain and whether or not we desire them. So Benazar's aim is to show that whichever view we adopt, every life is so bad that procreation can never be permissible and every life is always a harm. Man, this is such a strong claim, but but, but he's got an argument. So, so yeah. So, okay. Uh, so okay, let's. I want to. I want to relate each of these views on the quality of life to people with disabilities. So, how would that sort of story go on each view? So, I'm of course thinking about these uh, theories in relation to Hugo's life, and I focus on. Um, now we're gonna d- discuss, uh, and I focus in the book more on hedonistic theories and objectivist theories. Mm-hmm. So let's take the hedonistic view first: pleasures and pains. Uh, I'll quote Benatar again just to give the listeners an idea what kind of pleasures and pains there are in our everyday life. So he writes, Negative mental states include discomfort, pain, suffering, distress, guilt, shame, irritation, boredom, anxiety, frustration, stress, fear, grief, sadness, and loneliness. Positive mental states, pleasures in a broad sense, can be of two kinds. First, there are those which are relief from negative mental states. These relief pleasures include the subsiding subsiding of a pain, such as a headache, the mollification of an itch, the abatement of boredom, the alleviation of stress, the dissipation of anxiety or fear, and the assuagement of guilt. I don't know how to say that. Assuagement. Assuagement of guilt. Those are some nice words. Mm Mm-hmm. Um, Secondly, there are the intrinsically positive states. Intrinsic pleasures include pleasant sensory experiences, tastes, smells, visual images, sounds, and tactile sensations, as well as some non-sensory conscious states, such as joy, love, and excitement. Okay, so those are types of pleasures and pains. Mm -hmm. So... In the book, I ask, how much pleasure and pain was there in Hugo's life? Right. So, let's take the bad sides first. Sure. He was obviously very sick very often. He had three or four colds and three or four pneumonias. Uh, and getting better took usually at least one a month because of his thin airways and small lungs. It took really long time to recover. And he had to undergo several treatments. He was constantly congested when he was sick. He was coughing endlessly day and night. He also had a stomach flu or something like that a couple of times. He was throwing up a lot and so on. So out of the three years and 10 months of his life, he spent 14 weeks in the hospital. And that is almost 100 days and about... uh, yeah, about 100 days and about 7% of his total life. Mm-hmm. If we include the times he was sick at home, that number clo- grows close to 15%. Um, every day at home, we would do some physiotherapy so his arms and fingers and legs wouldn't become too stiff. He didn't really enjoy that, although he got to watch Peppa the Pig <laughs> while we stretched his limbs. Uh, it wasn't like very painful, but it wasn't nice either. Uh, 
the stretching, not the Pepe, Pepe the Pig. Sure. <laughs> Which is a great uh, series, by the way. Uh, I also dropped him to the floor a couple of times, which I really regret. It was mm. horrible, but parents know it can happen. Yeah. Um, he didn't break anything, thank God. Um, and on the other hand, 85% of his life, he was rather healthy and felt fine. Even from the hospital, we have several videos where he's laughing and having fun. So it's not like every time he was in the hospital, he was like suffering and in pain. Mm -hmm. It was a great hospital, which we can actually see from your window. Yeah. The Helsinki Children's Hospital. For me, that's an amazing place, but I won't get into that. Uh, he was a really happy and social kid. So when he was healthy, he really enjoyed swimming. Last summer was very hot and he spent time in this little pool uh, at our uh, his grandparents' uh, summer cottage. And sometimes five times a day he would go and swim or, or be in the pool. And when it was winter on snowy days, I took him to downhill sled sledging. Mm -hmm. On normal days, we would go to a trampoline and park and swing and all these different rides and things. And um, he also loved singing every night. He would actually sing him himself to sleep. I know parents of young children <laughs> are going to ask me, what did you do that he w some a small child would sing himself to sleep? Yeah. He did that. Uh, I would sing him, you know, an evening song and with my ukulele. Uh, it's actually my own Finnish translation of Stand By Me. Ah, okay. And uh, actually, every, every every time I sang that, I knew I might sing that or one another song in his funeral. I, I start the book, actually, with that song, my translation of that song. And um, so he was singing in his bed, and me and my wife just sat in our living room, eating and watching TV and guessing which songs he's trying to sing. He had a good uh, he mel did. melody. Yeah, he had a good, a good ear for that sort of thing. Yeah. yeah. So, um, and he didn't like eating his purees a lot, but he loved Nutella and cheese bread. In fact, cheese and Nutella was his last meal. He, we gave him some tastes, uh, uh, you know, when he was uh, in end-of-life care. And uh, actually, even after he had died and we were cleaning his body, there was still some Nutella and cheese on his lips. Um which I, I guess said something of these little enjoyments that actually are <laughs> important part of our lives. Mm -hmm. So now, obviously, there were a number of pleasures that our son never got to experience. This includes the pleasures of good food and food and drink, sexual pleasures and so on. But at the same time, he also avoided all the pains and hardships we come to experience as we grow up. Mm -hmm. Um, he never experienced bullying in school or at work or in the internet. Uh, every single human being he ever came into contact with loved him and was nice to him. He never had to worry about getting into school or finding a job. I mean, finding a school mm -hmm. um, or a university position. Uh, no one ever broke his heart. He never experienced the frustration we experience when we don't reach our goals. Yeah. We don't get our book done or we don't get that grant or we don't get that job and all that um, so a lot of things he didn't have to go through about that that we don't think um, that that we think are harms that mm -hmm. are the bad things in life now the death of a three-year-old child is clearly a bad thing it's it's, it's a horrible thing but as Benatar points out why do we think the death of someone who is 40 is a bigger harm than the death of someone who is 90, that, that there are very different things. Mm -hmm. uh, for all we know, no one lives to be 240 years, so, years old. Why don't we grieve every single death as much? So he says that death is always a harm for everyone. And even simply for that reason, mm -hmm. uh, only we shouldn't have children. And all, for that reason, only... Uh, Life is also harm for everyone. Mm -hmm. So a lot of radical claims. But but I think there's also a kind of segue into, or, or this helps us to rethink uh, the value of short lives. Yeah. So I think there's also something about the simplicity of childhood. So many of us remember their childhoods as the best time of their lives. 
perhaps because children are so carefree. Uh, if we asked early, elderly people to pick three years out of their lives uh, that they could relive, which years would those be? Uh, perhaps most would pick years from 18 to 21 or something like that. Uh, but at the same time, many could pick some of their childhood years. Uh, maybe no one would pick their years from zero to three because we don't really remember anything from the, that time. But at the same time, those years are not the worst times of our lives, right? Mm -hmm. So childhood is <laughs> a good time in our lives. So my overall point is this. Most, at least many of us, think that our lives include more good than bad, uh, more pleasure than pain. And we think our lives are worth living. Our existence is not a harm for ourselves. We, we like our lives. We think our lives are good. So, so, but even from a hedonistic point of view, the life of someone like Hugo may not actually be that much worse than our lives in general. Mm -hmm. At least not in a society where he can receive proper treatment. And I think some same thing could be said for my brother and your sister, both mm -hmm. of whom have a Down syndrome and a lot of other uh, disabled uh, children or, or adults. So... Yeah, that's my one of my main points. Mm -hmm. Okay, so so when it comes to evaluating evaluating one's like quality of life, so this this hedonistic viewpoint may seem just insufficient, especially to theists. So, what does Hugo's look, uh, life look like if we adopt this objective list view? And so, so you sent me this quote from Derek Parfit, who lists the following objective candidates that make life worth living. And so, here's what Parfit has to say. So he's going to say some great things are moral goodness, rational activity, the development of one's abilities, having children and being a good parent, knowledge, and the awareness of true beauty. And I like all those things that that, uh, that Parfit puts on that list. Uh, now, but it seems like Hugo and, and many other disabled children and adults, they're going to lack many of these objective qualities that make a life worth living or starting. So what do you what do you think about this sort of thing? On the one hand, I think there's a little hedonist inside all of us. We really try hard to avoid pain and to seek out pleasures. We are especially worried about the suffering of our children. And many of us think that we rather not have kids of our own than have a kid with a serious disease or disability if they have to suffer. And I totally get that. Uh, on the other hand, it is true that the hedonistic theory is clearly insufficient as an account of what made, makes life worth living, especially from a theological point of view. So how does the life of Hugo or your sister or my brother uh, look like from the perspective of these so-called objective list theories mm -hmm. of the quality of life? I think Hugo's life had many objectively good aspects. For example, the relationship he had with me, his mother, his grandparents and other family members, his caretaker, his physiotherapist even, who would come to our house every week, which was great. And uh, we experienced lots of good and fun times together. And such relationships obviously must be included in any objective list of a good life. I think his childhood could very well may have been much richer than the childhood of a healthy child who only has one parent and has very few intimate relationships. In fact, a few philosophers, philosophers who reject Benatar's categorical antinatalism but still feel the weight of this, his arguments and, and think he's making a good case, um, they often argue that the parent-child relationship is a worthwhile goal and uh, to pursue and a legitimate reason to have children mm -hmm. so they don't think uh, existence is always a harm or that uh, procreation is always wrong yeah so the value of that relationship is the, is a good thing in and of itself exactly mm -hmm. and it's a very important good mm -hmm. it's a very valuable thing and who go had that and um, but there are other things as well uh, creativity is one thing that objectively objectively makes life worth living. I think Hugo expressed his creativity by singing and being silly mm -hmm. uh, in yeah. different ways. He was a very social kid. 
He didn't seem to be cognitively uh, disabled in that respect. Which is really funny because he couldn't speak at the same time. He couldn't use language really. He had like two syllables that he used. Mm-hmm. And he could sing as well. But yeah, it, it's interesting. And I think we should value play as well. Uh, most people like to play with objects or toys or play games. Our good friend Aku Visala mm-hmm. is big on Legos. Yeah. So if you go visit his house, he will show you his Batmobile and his space module. Have you seen those? Uh, no, because um, but I, I know every time like I chat with me, he's like, yeah, I got some more Legos. So, you know, I'm working on these things. So yeah, yeah. I know he's 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 big on Legos. So Hugo didn't play with Legos, but. Duplos, Duplos, these mm. bigger, bigger things, and uh, with other toys, and yeah, I, I, I think that's valuable. I think that's good. I, I think play is something that makes life objectively good. At the same time, it is true that lives of many people with disabilities and serious diseases, like ISIL, lack important goods that do make lives worth living. For example, for me. What makes my life good and worth living is that I get to study and read and think and write about big questions and discuss them with my friends. If if all this was taken away from me, I would be quite miserable. Mm-hmm. You might as well. Oh, yeah, yeah. So Hugo obviously never experienced any of this. But there's one important objective aspect of a good life that we need to consider, and that is the meaning of life. And I will again quote Benatar. He writes, again, this is from his book, uh, Mm -hmm. Better Never to Have Been, The Harm of Coming into Existence. So he writes, A very plausible candidate for the list of objective goods is a life's having meaning. A meaningless life would be lacking an important good, even if it had other goods. So Benatar goes on to argue that our lives can have meaning only from our own human perspective. They are not meaningful from the perspective of the universe, which by which he means sort of a God's point of view, objective, you know, from the mm-hmm. universal point of view. Um, so we might feel like doing philosophy, you know, doing a podcast on these kinds of things mm-hmm. is meaningful, but it may not be objectively, objectively any more meaningful than watching sitcoms and eating ice cream all day long. Uh, but Benatar writes that it would be surely much better if our lives had meaning independently of our own human perspective, if they mattered from the perspective of the universe. Now, as a Christian, I obviously believe that God exists and that our lives are meaningful from God's point of view. In the philosophy of meaning of life, there's a big debate on whether the existence of God and a life after death is necessary for our lives to have meaning Mm -hmm. Uh, but it does at the very least seem clear that it's easier to believe our lives to have objective meaning if god exists and if there is an afterlife and uh, there would be a lot we could say about this but i think listeners understand that basic point yeah and and i guess one thought i have on this is even someone like Michael Tooley, who's like a very famous atheist philosopher of religion, when he's looking at these questions of like the value or the axiology of, of God's existence, he's like, yeah, if, if God exists, then there's a huge list of things we get. And some of the things on his list are objective meaning. Um, there's going to be justice. Uh, there's going to be an afterlife. There's going to be all these goods. And so he's like, yeah, that's on the list if God exists. So I think there's something very intuitive about this idea that if God does exist, there is a lot more meaning to be had, objective meaning. Yeah, there's, so he's not a moral realist. Um, well, no, so he's definitely a moral realist. Um, he says justice we only get with God. And there's certainly, but one of his frustrations is, yeah, if there's no God, then you don't get this ultimate justice in a lot of cases. And that does not make him happy. But he also thinks that the kind of evils we see in the world give us reason to think God does not exist. So he's, yeah, he seems like he's pretty staunchly committed to his moral realism from what I understand, but... Um, but he's still just like, yeah, not enough evidence for God. And these evils we see give us really good reason for thinking that God's not exist. But if God did exist, yeah, we'd get all this cool stuff. So yeah, that's, that's Thule. He's yeah, he's an interesting guy. Yeah. And I think we, someone might question whether Hugo's life having meaning is 
uh, was 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 a good thing for Hugo himself. Like he couldn't really reflect on the meaning of his life. Mm-hmm. Uh, so so would it be meaningful, uh, or would it be a good that kind of um, contributes to um, the quality of of his own life from his own perspective? But I think if we imagine that you know in the moment of our deaths mm-hmm. we get this uh, it's often said that you know your life runs through your eyes like like a film or something yeah and when you're close to you know when you get into a car accident or something if we imagine that um, that happens to all of us and even little children who don't have the cognitive ability to uh, critically reflect on their, those, their lives what if it happened to them as well that that they are able to think, see their lives, and also kind of ethically evaluate it, mm-hmm. or in in the sense that was my life worth living? Was it something that I I can be I can value? I'm happy that I was alive. Mm-hmm. So uh, if uh, Huga could see that uh, his life really had objective meaning somehow in God's big story, his life was uh, uh, part of it. And, and and part of the network of relationships and all that, I, I I think it would be very much easier for him to say that yes, my life definitely was worth living, mm-hmm. uh, and not only because I got to eat Nutella and cheese, yeah, and uh, uh, enjoyed playing and enjoyed the relationship with my parents and all that, but also because it it really was objectively meaningful. Yeah. Okay, so let's so let's talk about the afterlife here because I know that that one of the topics that's been on your mind a lot is the afterlife and and this this Christian hope for the resurrection and it's it's a natural thing to think about after you're suffering the loss of a loved one. I mean, it's something that comes to my mind usually when I'm when I'm thinking about these sort of issues and going through grieving. So what what are some of the questions that you're asking yourself right now about the resurrection? Yeah, so uh, my last chapter right now is titled "Will I Get to Hold My Son Again." And uh, that is a tricky question, even for someone who believes in an afterlife mm-hmm. and in heaven. In fact, I think almost everything we say about our existence in heaven is almost pure speculation. Uh, but I think it's at the same time worthwhile speculation uh, to do. Um, so one question is whether Hugo will have his disability in heaven. And this is something that philosophers of religion have recently uh, wrote, written mm-hmm. quite a bit about uh, will the physical signs of his eye cell disease still be there in his body so this condition affected every single cell of his body like with down syndrome his condition gave him his special facial facial features mm-hmm. like hugo was the cutest nordic blonde little boy you'll ever get to meet um, he had a big head and chubby cheeks, big eyes, long, beautiful eyelashes that many women envied, <laughs> and a thick, curly hair. He actually looked a little bit like Gizmo from the 1980s movie, The Gremlins. You remember The Gremlins? <laughs> yeah, I do, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. he was a bit like Gizmo. So, ironically, all of these features were partly caused by the disease. Uh, so, traditionally, it's been thought that there will be no any disabilities whatsoever or deformities and so on in heaven. For example, the 9th century theologian Methodius argued that re- resurrection is like remaking, rebuilding a damaged statue. Mm. So if an artificer, is that a word, artificer? Or just like the artist. Artist, yeah. The, yeah, the artist sees that uh, the statue he has made has been vandalized, it's been broken, uh, he is forced to melt it down completely and restore it to its former condition. So Methodius thinks that this is what God does with us. He thinks that uh, disease and disability, as the result, they are the result of fall into sin. And in order to do away with the effects of the fall, God will have to kind of rebuild our bodies completely. Mm. I guess in Hugo's case, this could mean something like. In heaven, he will look like what he would have looked like, looked like if it wasn't for that one gene, that was the root cause of his eye cell disease. And I guess, in the case of your sister and my brother, it would mean that they would look like what they would have looked like if it wasn't for that 
extra chromosome. Right. Yeah. Because that, that, I mean, that's something that I've I've thought about and pondered often, but I don't have any good answer to that that kind of question of what what, what would uh, what would Kelly look like without that extra chromosome. So yeah, I don't know. Um, so what are some of the other difficult kind of questions that you're you're thinking through here about the afterlife? Actually, at this, I I was thinking if no, oh, you want me to ask that question? No, no, I was oh, like yeah. thinking that if because. Mm-hmm. At this point, I don't have so much to say, and then you've done, you know, all mm-hmm. your thing with Amos oh, and yeah, others. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If we would like to chat a bit, so if you want to oh, talk yeah. about the kind of looks question, of course it yeah, relates to the second question. Yeah. But if if you want to kind of have a bit more of that discussion, because I haven't written down so much on this. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That sounds that sounds good. Um. So, <laughs> I guess so when I, when I've been trying to think through some of these issues, I've looked at like some different traditional views on, on these, on these things to see like what, like, you know, what do all my favorite dead theologians say about, about these topics. And they'll have these statements that everyone will be the same uh, shape and size uh, as they were um, when they died. Uh, and that's like a big question that gets asked. And, and a common answer is no, everyone will be the same height and everyone will be the same shape. Uh, and, and I'm like, now why? And there's some platonic intuitions about like this perfection of what, like, uh, like so apparently there's this perfect size and this perfect, uh, shape, and if I remember correctly, I think this originist—I uh, don't remember if Origen himself said this—but a bunch of people who kind of follow in his, in his in his thinking apparently held that everybody be like perfectly round. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Actually, I actually uh, mentioned that in my <laughs> in my book because it's like uh, another stupid idea that Origen had or originists. I should yeah. I should actually look that up because I haven't. If it's because that's himself. the thing is like sometimes I go back and look and I'm like, did Origen actually say that or was that just like something that people attributed to him because they don't like him uh, or is this like there were groups of people who did develop these ideas um but yeah i remember aquinas having this, this discussion on it going well no you don't need to be all the same size and they don't all be perfectly circular because that's just weird uh but but he said you do have to be proportionate because part of like the beauty uh of, of a physical body is that it's proportionate uh, uh. so so you'd be like a, a, this different. So your portions. eyes can't be too far from each other, right? Exactly. Yeah. The, yeah. They can't be too far apart. They, but uh, but I guess they wouldn't be too symmetrical either, though, because that always looks weird. If you've ever seen pictures of people where you make their eyes perfectly symmetrical, it's really creepy looking. So I don't know if Aquinas had thought about that. Um, but one of the other reflections that really that really tickles me is the age. So a lot of people will go, "Yeah, you'll be like around the age of 30. Like yeah. when you uh, uh, when you resurrected, because that was like that's how old Jesus was. You're like really in your prime at that moment, uh, and they'll give these kind of reasons. And when they ask these questions of, well, what about like a child who died? Uh, like, how how are they going to get there? And the answer is, well, they got the potential to grow. Um, it just didn't get realized because they died. Well, when God resurrects them, they can still have the potential to grow. So they, there you go. You just they just grow. So, but I, but I, 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 those are like, I find those fascinating, but I just don't know like what age to say or something, but, but I do think you'd have to have a a body that is fit for eternity, like something that you're going to be happy with, something that you could really enjoy the new creation with. Those are some intuitions I have at least about this. Yeah, it's, it's quite funny. It's might sound somewhat discriminatory of children Mm -hmm. and the elderly. Like if everyone's going to be 30 Mm -hmm. (laughs) in heaven, that sort of reminds me of gospel of Thomas, where it said that Mary will have to become male before she can enter heaven. Yeah. (laughs) It it actually says for every woman who makes herself male will enter into kingdom of heaven. I don't know what that means, Yeah, (laughs) but It, it sounds weird. Like that maybe if they had, the idea, the writer, that males are more perfect mm-hmm. human beings than women are. Being a woman is sort of a disability. But but I think those examples are actually helpful because we can see kind of our, like our own biases. Mm-hmm. And at the same time, uh, we had this discussion earlier that you don't think that uh, it, it makes sense to say that everyone gets to keep keeps their disabilities in heaven yeah uh, that that uh, that disability is simply something in our in the environment it's purely social and uh that everyone will have their disability in heaven and will be okay with it 
Yeah, I've taken a pretty hard line on this because I don't think that disability could be uh, written down as purely social, like just the product of society. Uh, so if you, I guess very few people actually think that. Yeah, I don't think. Yeah, uh, I just feel like it's just a small number of philosophers who think that sort of view. Um, but yeah, I, I just, I just want to go no. If if I've got uh, chronic fatigue syndrome, because uh, I had a friend who had that. That's not. <laughs> there's nothing about society that's uh, that's 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 making her like constantly just like fall asleep or like mm-hmm. randomly and just crash, you know, uh, while she's walking down the stairs. That's a that's a like a very physical thing. And so I've taken a really hard line to say, no, these disabilities will be gone. Uh, like, they'll be removed. And one of the, 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 one of the things I pointed out in my publication on this topic is when you look at the healing ministry of Jesus, like, he's going around and anybody who's, like, deaf, anybody who's mute, anybody who's lame, anybody who's got, you know, you name it, he's, he's just healing them left and right. And I've had a lot of disability theologians just kind of skip over that, that part of the argument. And just go, well, there's Jesus can heal, but he can't cure. And I'm like, tell me what the difference is between these two. Mm-hmm. And I can't find one. And they just kind of skip over I don't know, the, the entire ministry of Jesus. Like, so I just, I just find that really bizarre. Uh, so yeah, so like, yeah, I've, I've taken, yeah, like I said, I've taken a pretty hard line on that, on that issue in the past. Yeah. What was the distinction that Kevin Timpe uses also that mm. uh, mere difference and, uh, uh, that difference. So, so yeah, this comes from Elizabeth Barnes, uh, her book on the minority body, uh, which is which is really really fascinating. It's well argued. So she has this distinction she makes between uh, bad making differences, good making differences, and then just mere difference. And what uh, what what uh, what do those mean? Yeah. So so say I've got like the ideal body because anybody who's seen me knows I obviously have the like the ideal <laughs> human body. And so you could be like anything that like looks different from Ryan, we could put in one of these three categories. Uh, and so say like you've got this really bad uh, limp, you know, like your like your legs really busted up for some reason. Well, it'd be like okay, well that's a bad making difference. You can't walk perfectly. You can't uh, do like uh, certain activities you normally want to do. So it's like a bad. It somehow like you know brings bad things to your life. Um. Say you're like actually, you know, you're a little bit like a little bit stronger than me. Uh, somehow you're able to be stronger than me. You know, well then that'd be a good making difference. But then uh, say your hair color is just a slightly different color from mine. Well, it's just a mere difference. It's not really like good or bad. Um, it's just different. And so what uh, people like uh, Kevin Tempe and Scott Williams uh, and some others, what they've done is try to apply that to the resurrection. And so the thought is supposed to go something like this. God will eliminate any disabilities or diseases that are bad making differences, but he's not going to eliminate any that are in the category of mere making difference because they're just, it's just merely different from there though. It's, it's hard to figure out what's all going to fall into which category. And that's where you're going to have to have some further conversations and some further debates. And those are where I think the debates should be um, because it does seem right to me that like anything that makes your life bad, God's going to eliminate it. Mm. Um, I just don't know how far that goes because my intuitions about which disabilities and disorders will have to go away, they're fallible. But then when I look at the healing ministry of Jesus, it seems like he's just happy to get rid of like just tons of stuff that yes. different activists today might go, no, 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 those are mere differences. And Jesus is like, well, I got rid of it. So what do you want? Hmm. And yeah, so I, I, I like the distinction. I think it's helpful, but I don't know how far it takes me in terms of getting me to move me away from the view that I want to affirm. Yeah. So something I realized when I was writing this chapter, I haven't finished it, mm-hmm. but that there's something disappointing about this theology. Like when you, when a parent who grieves uh, a, a baby, they're lost like we are or, or a son mm-hmm. is, is is that it's not, he's not going to be <laughs> the same boy anymore right. anyway like no one is giving me much hope that it will be the same same boy he will he might be 30 and he he might not look the same way because uh if his uh, disability will be gone at the same time i guess kevin could say that uh, uh his looks are there's nothing wrong with his looks he mm-hmm. was actually a, a very cute boy mm-hmm. that may be a good making difference right so so he might get to keep it uh for all eternity who knows um and and, and there's also these worries about um of course he he might be a big boy mm-hmm. so i might not be able to hold him mm-hmm. or or carry him like i used to of course in a sense every parent loses their 
child when they grow up, right? Yeah. So you never a, a mother whose son is uh, 30 usually doesn't have the <laughs> can't carry their son anymore right. and so on. So everyone kind of loses their children at some point. But but yeah, it's uh, the, the, I have to admit there is something uh, a little bit disappointing about thinking about the resurrection. Um, and there's also this question that I've been wondering is like, how do we, if we look different, how do we know, you know, who's who? Mm-hmm. How do I know this is my son? And perhaps there's there could be something similar to as as in the story of the Mount of Transfiguration, which I some other day called Mount of Disfiguration. <laughs> That's not it. <laughs> Mount of Transfiguration, um, where Peter, James, and John immediately recognize uh, Elijah and Moses for some reason. Yeah. And a per- I, I don't think they had pictures of Elijah and Moses, but they just knew. Yeah, some of them just know, and it is weird. Yeah, Yeah. so maybe we know who's who in heaven. Um, yeah, even, even if they look really different than the last time we saw them on Earth. I don't know. We don't know, but it's fun to speculate about. It is, and it's something that my family and I have talked a lot about uh, since I first started working on disability theology, because these two different points that you brought up, um, recognition and then like wanting to hold your child, those things come up a lot oh, really? in the literature. Yeah, there's one, I want to say it's Frances Young. Um, I think it's I think it's her book where she talks about if, if her son's not disabled in heaven, then like she's lost something really significant uh, and because she's got this, you know, she has this relationship of taking care of her child for so long. The, the idea of like losing that is just awful. There's to some extent I get that, but I don't know how far that, that intuition can really go. And here's why. So like you mentioned before, every parent's going to lose the ability to continue to hold their kid. And then at some point, your kids, they don't want you to hold them either. So <laughs> I, I kind of want well, words. I don't on, want my mom to hold me yeah. for a long time, at least. Yeah. And and, and so I, I'm kind of like, hang on, who's, who, whose desire matters more here? Uh, is it like my desire to always see like my kid um, exactly as I remembered them? Or but what about their desires? What, what about what they want? And I'm like, I feel like that, that's got to factor in there somewhere. And... And then the recognition issue, I remember for a while during my master's when I first started thinking about this, that one really bothered me. I thought this was so important. And then uh, I had this conversation with my mom. So she taught uh, primary school for a very long time. So like first and second graders. And she talked about this experience very regularly of, you know, the students she had, they grow up, they're adults. She sees them and they're like, oh, Mrs. Mullins, like, it's it's so nice to see you. And, And she'll have to look at them and be like, you're one of my students, but I don't clearly don't recognize you because you're, you know, you're not like seven years old anymore. Sometimes like she might be able to see something about them that would strike her. Uh, and she's like, okay, that's, I, I remember who you are. And then other times it's just like, no. And she's reintroduced to them. And I realized, well, yeah, what's the big deal about being reintroduced? So my sister is super excited about, about uh, the resurrection because she'll get to meet my grandfather. Mm. Uh, and, and she's, and she's out often asked, she's like, do you think grandpa will recognize me? Uh, and I'm like, well, yeah, he never met you. And she's like, yeah, I know. But so do you think he's going to recognize me? Cause that's like something that really bothers her. And I keep thinking, well, who cares? Like, he'll just be, just be like, Hey, I'm your granddaughter. And he'll be like, Oh, awesome. Let's get to, let's chat. Let's get to know each other. Like, that's kind of how I think about it. It's like some of these things that seem like they've kind of really grabbed the attention of a lot of disability theologians. I want to, I want to go, I understand because those are valuable things. Holding your child is a valuable thing. Uh, being able to recognize people like loved ones. Those, those are valuable things. But you can so quickly get over it because you get to carry on with the rest of the relationship. And that's the thing that really matters is that ongoing development of the relationship with the community of God. Yes. So, yeah. So, yeah, it doesn't move me to get to take my hard line, uh, supposedly ableist position, um, even though uh, a lot of people in my sister's uh, special needs Bible study thought I was affirming their view. But a lot of people told me I have an ableist view. Yeah, I, I like what you said about the development of the relationship because that is the central thing. Of course, uh, physical contact uh, is an important part of our relationships. Yeah. It's not only cerebral, cerebral mm-hmm. if you will. Yeah. Um, uh, so, so, so there is this uh, touching and holding element to our relationships, but 
of course, to some extent, that can happen also in heaven. Mm -hmm. uh, even if we are not small, our, our children are not small enough for us to hold any longer or something like that. But yeah. Yeah. So I don't know. Like you said, it's hard to figure out what's going to happen in the afterlife. It's all very speculative. But I do think it's important to think about because it is, it is the hope that we proclaim. Uh, and I think speculating about these things I know for my sister and for myself, it often does give us hope uh, in, in, in the in the resurrection. So, yeah. So thank you so much, though, for sharing the story with uh, with us today. I know this is not the easiest thing to always share, but I really appreciate it. This has been a really fascinating conversation. So thank you for that. Thanks for having me. And there you have it. Another episode of the Reluctant Theologian podcast. Stay tuned for more episodes on philosophical theology. 